for the time, Jason of Star Command was probably one of the most expensive shows, uh, certainly, on Saturday morning TV. Uh, I believe the budget on the show was close to $200,000 an episode, which at the time was an amazing budget. But we had all these great special effects and all of these things and goo that flew around and, and did things. It broke a lot of ground in terms of children's television. In the 38th century, a space-age soldier of fortune named Jason works with Star Command, a secret organization headquartered at Space Academy. Joining Jason on his adventures are computer genius Captain Nicole Davidoff, Professor E.J. Parsifoot, the alluring alien powerhouse Samantha, dashing Commander Carnarvon, and grumpy Commander Stone. Aiding Jason is the powerful mini-robot Wiki. They all must work together to stop the evil Dragos from attaining his goal to become master of the cosmos. Airing on CBS beginning in the fall of 1978 season, Jason of Star Command was the final groundbreaking live action series from Filmation Studios. The most expensive Saturday morning children's show ever produced, Jason featured a talented ensemble cast and special effects by some of the technical wizards who had created Star Wars. For two seasons, Jason's serialized adventures ruled the airwaves and launched the series into television history. Now, you can learn exciting secrets about the series from its creators and actors. Blast off for excitement with The Adventures of Jason of Star Command. Jason of Star Command, 1978 CBS Saturday morning breakthrough show. It's a sequel really to Space Academy. We use some of the same stuff, some of the same people. We really tried to find a guy, I guess it was Indiana Jones time, and we found Craig Littler, who was just perfect. He walked in and saw him, and my, my, my former partner, who's now no longer with us, Norman somehow got in touch with an agent who got us in touch with him. And the first time I met him, I just, I just you, you knew the guy was the right guy. I got a call from my agent who sent me to the casting director, and the casting director uh, asked me to come out to, um, actually it was the stage that we ended up shooting Jason on, this, this warehouse. Uh, actually it was a warehouse with a bunch of different sets, and we just kept going around this warehouse. I went out and auditioned for uh, Lou Scheimer, who uh, we, I saw again for the first time in 27 years when we were doing the commentaries. Great seeing him, great guy. He and Art Nadell, who's the director, and I met with them and I auditioned. I walked out the audition room and um, Lou came out and said, Craig, we, we want to offer you the part, <laughs> before they even talked to my agent. I had a really tight costume, that's, that's true. Um, I, um, well, it was that, you know, that outer space hero thing. They wanted everything tight. They wanted the guy to have a good body, you know, and everything. So everything was tight. In fact, when I had to do that open sequence, when I crashed through the door at the opening of every show, they wanted to put pads on me so that when I hit the floor, uh, that I didn't get bruised or banged up, which I did. I got really banged up. We must have done it a dozen times. And uh, I couldn't put pads under this <laughs> that outfit because it was so tight. Uh, but it looked good, you know. I had the high boots and, um, you know, the blouse pants and, you know, the, I had the cool belt, you know, and I could hang on it and I had all the little gizmos, you know. So it was, it was a great outfit. I, mean, it, it, I thought it looked good. Of course, I was younger then and I could, I could get away with it then. I still look pretty good, though. Man, you know, I mean, I could still wear that outfit. It's a little larger, <laughs> I guess. We had Sid Haig, who had done nothing but motorcycle pictures before that. He was always riding a motorcycle and killing somebody. Perfect villain. He did the, the helmet. It was built around his head. I mean, he, he couldn't get it off after a while. You know, this business is really very funny. Um, with the body of work that I had, I, I said, you know, I would probably never be asked to do a soap opera and 126 episodes of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman later, I was proved wrong. And another thing that I often thought was that I would never be asked to be in uh, children's programming. And one day I got the call to go in for an interview for Jason of Star Command. 
well, you know, stranger things have happened, I guess, but not to me. And I went in, it was a very easy process, one interview, and it was a done deal. Uh, and I had a great time doing it. I think the costume did more acting than I did. We're talking about uh, 1978, and they had basically just started working with AB compounds, you know, where you put the two things together and it becomes a foam substance. That's how they were going to create the helmet. And so they laid me down on a table and put a, um, a paper towel tube in my mouth and wrapped my head in saran wrap and then poured this stuff over my head. And it pardoned. And there I was with this big kind of tan blob on my head, which they cut away enough so that they could get it off of me and then sculpted, basically sculpted the helmet uh, from there down to something that was maybe a quarter of an inch thick, very light, easy to work with. And they went to um, uh, a toy store and bought like 25 or 30 different models, car models, plane models, ship models, and they took all the pieces, threw them out on a table and just started grabbing stuff and sticking it on the helmet. The one thing that no one really thought about until after it was done was that when they cast Craig Littler as Jason, um, lo and behold, we were both the same height. And Dragos had to be more imposing, bigger, more menacing. So I wore uh, six inch platforms on my boots, which took me to six foot 10. And uh, they were light, they were cork, uh, but just kind of difficult to move quickly in. Thank God I really didn't have to move quickly during the show. Sid and I were the, probably the closest because we went on those personal appearances and we did things above and beyond the show together. You know, we went off to Ohio together and to these different, you know, personal appearances. And he was just the... Uh, he was the antithesis of his character. He was absolutely the complete opposite. He's this big, huge guy, uh, and I'm 6'4", and I, he's probably about the, my same size. I think he's like 6'3". He was about two, 220 pounds, big with this bald head and this goatee and this mustache and goatee. And he had that, you know, that, that laugh of his uh, that's his classic in the show. He was just the antithesis of what you saw there. He was the sweetest guy in the world. Craig Littler, uh was an amazing guy. I mean, he was Jason. Uh, he just personified the good guy, you know. Uh, and he had a strength to him, which which made for a very good adversary. And we had a great time together. We did some personal appearances together, traveled around the country doing that kind of stuff, and, and we just had a great time together. Took him away. <laughs> Not escape this time, Jason. The cast members were great. Um, I did most of the work, I suppose, the first year. Most of it was with Susan O'Hanlon, and then Tamara Dobson the second year because she took over for, for uh, with Susan. Susan uh, was, I, I, I think she actually went by Susan O'Hanlon in the show, um, but that was her stage name, Susan Pratt. Susan was great. She was very uh, uh, darling. A uh, little girl, I mean, she was just, she was small, you know, and just darling, uh, really sweet, good little actress. Charlie Dell, who was the comic interest, and Tamara Dobson, who was a beautiful, beautiful black lady. I uh, wish she had been here to be auditioned today. I would like to hire her all over again. Charlie Dell was a great, a great young actor to work with. He, he, uh, he played Parsifoot, this really bizarre sort of, you know, other world sort of character. He was great. He, he, was, uh, he was a very um, animated, real creative guy. He, 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 he took that little character and made a lot out of it. I mean, it was really quite, you know, quite fun. He made, made it really fun. I think what a lot of people didn't realize at that point is how good an actor he is. As you were. Tamara Dobson uh, was and, you know, is, uh, I should say, a, a striking, striking woman. She is uh, well over six feet tall, so we were almost eye to eye. And um, 
very exotic looking and just she was a clown she would cut up she would have a great time she'd pull little tricks and stuff and and it was just always a pleasure to to be around her you might remember jimmy doohan from all of the star trek movies uh played scotty okay and that show was down, of course, when we were doing this show, so he was signed on as the commander. A consummate professional, rolled with the punches, and I was just so happy he came in one day with it and made the announcement that they were going to do the first Star Trek film, and he was going to, you know, uh, reprise his role as Scotty. I was just so happy for him. John Russell took over for Jimmy Doohan uh, in the second season, and by that time we had gone intergalactic, if you will. And so he was obviously from a planet other than Earth because he was blue and never complained about having to get into the chair and go blue every day. And I had worked with John Russell before in the pilot for Alias Smith & Jones. So we were able to reconnect for Jason of Star Command, and uh, the guy is just an absolute pleasure to be around. The most difficult cast member was uh, that, that, little, uh, that little Wiki, yeah. Wiki was a problem. Wiki had, had a life of his own, and he was just this little box that they had hooked up to these electronic, these, you know, and it would, he would beep you know, with his little beeps to answer us. And it, it, like, he never, it never wanted to work. The thing wouldn't work. We'd be shooting and they'd be going, cut, cut, cut. They couldn't get it to beep, they couldn't get it to walk because he had to walk and they had him on wires and then they'd have him walk along this little, you know, parts of the set and, and along the floor. And, and uh, it's just amazing, that little thing had a mind of its own. It's like it was, it was alive. It just decided not to work. And of course, then they'd shut the camera off and It'd, you know, they'd start working. they go, roll them, roll them quick. And then, of course, it'd stop again. Lou Scheimer and Norm Prescott were producers that not only knew what it was that they were doing, they knew their genre. Uh, they knew who it was that they were playing to and were able to construct shows that were classics. Not only Jason of Star Command, but uh, I'll just name one, Fat Albert, okay? Everybody remembers that show. And they were, they were gentlemen. They were classic Hollywood gentlemen. Um, I met up with Lou Scheimer um, at the uh, San Diego Comic Con in um, July of 06. And I had to tell him at that point that he didn't know it at the time, but he not only saved me career-wise in terms of uh, feeling good about what I was doing and who I was, but he literally saved my family um, financially. By, by giving me that role. Um, <laughs> and he joked and he said, God, I could have gotten it cheaper. Uh, <laughs> uh, I did have to mow his lawn a couple of times, but you know, that's okay. That's all out under the bridge. Lou is just the sweetest guy in the world. As you know, I just saw him here earlier today and he's still here, I think. And um, I just, you know, I hadn't seen him in so long. I mean, he looked, in fact, I think he was sitting here when I first saw him. And he looked, he looked almost the same, I mean, 27 years later. Art Nodell was um, a director who is the kind of guy that I like to work with. He had a clear vision for what it was that he wanted to do. He was able to impart that to you, and then he kind of just got out of the way and let you do your work. I think he directed every one of them. I don't recall another director. I think he did all of them. The special effects and makeup people on this show 
were consummate professionals. I mean, they did things with machinery and electronics and, and makeup that, um, to that point, I had never seen. I mean, any one of these guys could have created anything for any of the gags on other shows like Mission Impossible, which was full of gags, uh, Star Trek, any of those shows. They could have worked on any of them. Um, I, we were extremely f fortunate to, to be able to work with, with a team like this. It was all in one big warehouse. I mean, we would just go from one little cubicle area to the next, and, and they'd have it you know, all set up. It was a big, it was a fairly big warehouse, but uh, the, uh, the sets were great. The councils and, and the, the spaceship, when I'm in the spaceship and looking out at the stars, and you know, the whole councils, the way they had them working electrically and everything, and the lights, and I mean, it was fun. You know, you were pushing things and things were lighting up, and, and it, it really helped you get into the uh, sort of the uh, you know, the, the feeling of the, the character and the, the outer space sort of you know, feeling. After the first season of uh, Space Academy, which I guess was pretty successful, at least on television and so forth, they decided to do a second season, which was called Jason of Star Command. And I was hired again to come back in and supervise visual effects, only things were a bit different this time. On Jason, the, my work responsibilities were much more administrative. The thing that was good was they had hired a couple of director of photographies and we had some new technology in the form of microcomputers so that we could do repeat moves on spaceships. We could generate in-camera mats so that we could, so that the spaceships could move and the star fields could move, which was something we very seldom did on the first show. I think the favorite effects, and I say effects as opposed to effect on Jason was the computerization of the tracks and being able to do swooping Star Wars inspired camera moves and, and, and miniature moves so that the spaceships you know, would fly through space, the stars would all move, we would get planets, we would do in-camera compositing of various different elements using a camera bipack system. That was a very big achievement and led to me probably meeting Roger Corman and winding up doing Battle Beyond the Stars. On Jason of Star Command, I was credited as, uh, as I remember, uh, as doing stop motion visual effects along with Stephen Sherikus. Uh, and we would do the stop motion critters usually. The insect creature in the first season, that thing appeared in two episodes of the first season. And then uh, in the second season, we got broader responsibilities. I think we did four or five stop motion creatures. And then we also did uh, various uh, compositing effects using our uh, front and rear projection units. We composited the uh, giant creature that uh, John Beekler created in the second season and also added spaceships to scenes where they actually wanted to show the live action people in the same scene with them. Stephen, being the sculptor, would start with this design. He would build the armature, the stop motion, metal uh, skeleton that goes inside of the creature. He then sculpt the creature in clay over the this metal skeleton, make the appropriate molds, inject foam rubber into the mold, paint it up, and that was, was Stephen's responsibility. My main responsibility was lighting and photographic work, so I would set up the front projection, the camera, and, uh, and, the, and the lighting to make it look like it's blending into the background. And then when it came to the actual hands-on animation of the stop motion, Stephen and I split that pretty much 50-50 through the show. We would use uh, front and rear projection to composite the live action with the stop motion, which was, you know, the old standby system that uh, Willis O'Brien used on King Kong and Ray Harryhausen used on Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. We'd shoot the live action on the stage onto 35 millimeter film, make background plates, the, the lab would make background plates. We would then put these into special projectors. In fact, one of my projectors that I used had originally been built for Citizen Kane, so it shows you know, how old these things are. The technology did not change. It was very standard over the years and of very high quality. And uh, we used front projection because I think the image quality was, was better. You would project from the front onto a scotch light screen and, uh, and uh, create split screens in much the same way that Ray Harryhausen did, what they call his dynamation, to take out the support. So the creature would uh, 
be standing back into the live action. He could come out from behind a real rock and peer around it. That was all done with a miniature front projection and, and stop motion right on a miniature stage. I had just hit Hollywood and I was uh, hungry to work. I, I actually had some jobs doing props, uh, building Pillsbury Doughboys and that sort of thing, but that's not really what I wanted to do. I wanted to do makeup effects and creatures. So one day I, I packed up my portfolio and I walked down the streets of Hollywood and, and uh, down the streets of the valley wherever there was a studio and I just knocked on doors. And Filmation Studios was one of the doors that actually opened for me. I was ultimately hired to do the live action creature effects, uh, whether it's a makeup effect, a mask, or a full body. That's what my gig was. They had already had Steven Cherkis and Jim Apparel doing all the stop motion animation. And they wanted, I guess, sort of a Star Wars-y kind of feel to it where there were you know, guys with blue faces and green faces and scales and stuff walking around the corridors too. So that's essentially what my job was there. I actually worked in the model kit area before I graduated doing makeup effects because they hadn't written any scripts yet, so they didn't know what they wanted me to build. And so after they wrote some scripts, then okay, uh, this one shoots uh, Monday. Go for it. So, ah! And the first episode, I think, had five creatures in it. Full body. Hands, faces, bodies, breastplates, everything. I would make color renderings of the creature that I'd make, or the creatures that I'd make, based on the screenplay given to me, um, the producer and director would go, that one, not that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one, and that one, uh, by next Monday, okay. And so the process would then be for me to throw uh, some clay on a life mask and start sculpting very quickly and uh, make a mold and start pumping out foam replications of the mask. Meanwhile, um, I begin to build the musculature understructure. I'd start with a, a spandex body stocking. I'd use uh, foam, like upholstery foam, and build muscle groups on it, glue it to the body stocking. I'd spatulate foam latex over the uh, muscles and uh, I'd put aluminum foil on, over it, bake it with a hair dryer because they didn't have a walk-in oven at the time. Then I'd paint it, stick hair on it if it needed it, and it was done. I'd say that there's a soft spot in my heart for that uh, boardroom of monsters at, at uh, Dragos's table. None of them were really uh, terrific uh, works of art, but I think in context with the, with the color and the lighting and with uh, Dragos there, and the monsters didn't have any dialogue. They were, rawr, 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 rawr. You know, it was just fine. You know, I, I think you have to look at uh, one of these shows in, in the context of what it is. It's a kid's TV show that goes on Saturday mornings. And um, given the limited resources, I think uh, it turned out just fine. I'm looking forward to seeing this on DVD. I have an 11-year-old and two six-year-olds. Being a person who does primarily horror films, they don't get to see too much of my work, so it'll be great. Since Jason of Star Command, um, I stayed with stop motion for a number of years. I, I did stop motion on uh, Dreamscape and on Troll. In fact, Troll was directed, uh, the live action was directed by John Beekler. So there we collaborated together in a different way. And uh, mostly I was doing photographic work for many years. And of course, once the computers came in, uh, I had to learn that and change over. It, but I will say the things I learned on Jason, the disciplines and uh, many of the concepts and uh, carried over to what I do on the computer now. So nothing is ever lost. We're using different approaches, but uh, you know the, the process of analyzing and, and, uh, and uh, coming up with creative solutions is still very much the same. Over the years, 
that I've been working in the industry, special effects, visual effects especially, especially have changed uh, with the advent of uh, digital uh, animation, uh, of computerized images, uh, and all of the things really sophisticated uh, motion capture and performance capture. Uh, however, in reviewing some of the images on the show, I have to say I'm pretty proud of what we uh, generated for Space Academy and Jason of Star Command. I got uh, quite a bit of fan mail. In fact, I just looked at some of that fan mail before I came over here today. I hadn't looked at it in, oh, I don't know, 25 years. I um, went through a, um, a folder that I have of a bunch of uh, different letters I got from these kids who were probably, I don't know, in their 30s or 40s now. And I'm reading, you know, they're sending this, these letters to Jason, you know, Jason of Star Command, not Craig Littler. They were always going to Jason, you know. And uh, I, I had a lot of fun with it for years. I got recognized quite a bit with the families, with the kids, and I always enjoyed that. I do a lot of horror film conventions, and people definitely that grew up in the, you know, that were growing up in, in the late 70s, remember the Dragos character. They come to me, they talk about it, and remember it fondly. And it's, it's great to, to be able to interact with them and be there and get their take on what the show was about and what it meant to them. <laughs> I was at Rob Zombie's wedding. Uh, Rob and, and Sherry Moon Zombie. Uh, and I was talking with his brother and he said, you know, this is really weird. And I said, what, the wedding? And he said, no, standing here talking to you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when, when Rob and I were kids, we used to get up every Saturday morning and watch you on Jason of Star Command. And that stuck with him all those years. And when he had an opportunity to give me the go ahead on, on this role, he took it. And thank you, Rob. I've done a lot since Jason. At the present, I'm, um, I'm the Gorton Fisherman. Hopefully I'll be doing it for some time to come. But I don't think the folks would recognize me because I've got this, you know, full beard on and my hair is down to here. And uh, <clears throat> it's just a whole different look. 28 episodes, as I recall, and um, a lot of hard work was put into them. Uh, a lot of uh, dedicated actors and the producers and directors and set designers. and A lot of effort was put into that show to entertain your kids. And now these fans' kids are going to be watching. The, uh, my fans' kids are going to be watching these shows now. Uh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you talk about the whole cycle coming around to, uh, you know, kids, I guess, were watching me were turning down their 30s and 40s, I and mean, their kids are going to be watching these again. It's just amazing. I, I find it uh, it's flattering and uh, very interesting. I hope they enjoy watching them as much as we enjoyed making them. My kids um, were, I believe, like 9 and 10 years old at the time. And um, they thought it was neat that dad was on TV, but we were all involved, heavily involved in soccer. So they never really got to see any of the episodes because we were always at a soccer field somewhere. As a matter of fact, I only got to see the show twice and both times it was the same episode. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, this box set of Jason of Star Command is going to generate a whole new audience and year by year this audience will grow because I said so. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. Well, you'd better put some dinner on the stove, folks. I'm coming home. <laughs> we'll be waiting, Jason. <laughs> When Sid and I went on the road, we did uh, 
a few different gigs, if you will, together. We, we went to Ohio uh, to this circus and uh, they set up this whole um, platform there with all the lighting. They had some pyrotechnics and everything, a little puffs of smoke coming up. And we came out and the lights were all dark and then they pin spotted us and, and Sid and I had this good guy, evil guy, good guy thing going on. And the audience, they were just applauding all these kids. I <laughs> just loved it. And you know, it's very interesting. You know, you think at that point you're starring in a show and you're, you're sitting there in Ohio at the circus and you go after your little act, you go off stage and you're going to sign autographs for all these, uh, these kids, which we did, hundreds of them. I mean, it was absolutely classic. Now, 20 feet away to my right were elephants, the back ends of elephants. I mean, it was just so bizarre. I mean, it was just like being in the circus. We weren't 20 feet away from all the animals and everything. I was sitting there signing autographs for all these kids who are going, oh, oh. It was great. We had a great time.